Hi there, welcome to your online sociology lesson. We are going to continue looking at our cage factors in education. So that's class, age, gender and ethnicity. Um, and today we are going to look at ethnicity as a factor in educational achievement. So basically, what are the differences in students from different ethnic backgrounds? Do some ethnic backgrounds perform better in schools? Do some perform worse? And that key question in sociology, why? Why do we have a difference in ethnic backgrounds, in ethnic performance in education, given that we live in what is meant to be a meritocratic society? So why is there a difference in how some students perform compared to others? So in today's session, we're going to try and achieve three things. OK, the first is to be able to explain the statistics surrounding ethnicity and educational achievement. These are the facts. OK, these is what we have as evidence, as quantitative data to show us that there is, in fact, a difference between some groups and others. Secondly, we need to be able to describe the key factors behind those differences. So that's the why. OK, so we're going to look at what first and then we're going to look at why that might be. And there are four main factors we're going to look at today. OK, this is not a, a, a limited list. There are other factors out there, but I'm going to pick out the four kind of key factors and you need to be able to describe each of them and their criticisms. And the final thing is that, that skill of evaluation. This is the really key skill for GCSE sociology is to be able to evaluate what you think is the most influential factor. And you can't do that unless you've been able to describe all of them first. That's going to be all that we're going to go in. So to start off with, what are the facts? Well, the facts are pretty simple and they kind of haven't really changed for a number of years. Um, we can see from this table that children from Chinese and Indian backgrounds consistently perform better than other ethnic groups in the UK. OK, so this this graph here shows the percentage of children achieving uh, five or more A star to C grades in English and maths in 23, uh, 2013 and 2014. Now, this is obviously about seven years old, but the data has not really changed very much since then. Chinese and Indian uh, children tend to do the best out of all ethnic groups. Um, and then at the other end of the table there, we can see that the lowest achieving groups typically include black and Pakistani children. Now, we need to look at why that is. And there's a whole range of differences. And as I've said, I'm going to talk about the four main ones today. But it's really, really important that you understand this statistic, that these groups generally look like this on graph. So Chinese and Indian um, ethnicity groups at the top and then uh, groups such as Pakistani uh, and Black Caribbean near the bottom. You can see there near the middle of that table, the blue line, that's the national average. OK, for that year. And you can see that white British is just very, very slightly below that national average. So white British children um, generally don't perform as well as children from um, Asian, uh, Chinese, Indian, etc. backgrounds. We can also see that um, despite having kind of differences between them, levels of academic achievement are improving across all ethnic groups. So the left hand uh, line on the graph, the blue line is from 2006, 2007, and then the red line is from 2010, 2011. And you can see that in every ethnic group, be it white British, be it Indian, be it Black Caribbean, um, the proportion of children achieving A star to C has increased. OK, so there is a rise across achievement from all ethnic groups. But that means that if every group is, is increasing, then the difference between them still remains the same because it's not that one group is, in, is improving kind of more than the others. We can also see, and we've looked at this kind of before, we can also see that Black Caribbean students remain the most likely to be permanently excluded from schools. If you cast your eyes over to the right hand side um, onto this graph, you can see that Black Caribbean students um, in both 2011, 2012, 2012, 2013 were the most likely to be permanently excluded from schools. Um, and you can see at the in the very, very middle that children from Indian backgrounds 
um, their likelihood to be public tutored was, was nearly zero. Okay, and you can obviously contrast that with how Indian children are performing um, across national league tables. They're performing very, very highly. So there's a correlation here, isn't there, between academic performance being high and exclusion levels being low, or academic performance being low and exclusion levels being high. So when we look at education achievement, we're not just looking at GCSE data. We're looking at children who get excluded. We're looking at children who get into trouble at school because that's all part of achieving or not achieving in education. OK, so don't don't fall into the trap of just thinking this is about GCSE grades. Obviously, that's a massive part of it, but there's more to it as well. So it's really important that you remember three key facts. Number one. Indian and Chinese children generally seem to do better than others in UK schools. Number two, rates of academic performance and GCSE grades are improving across all ethnicities. And number three, children from Black Caribbean backgrounds remain the most likely to be permanently excluded from schools. And we need to look at why that is for all of those, certainly number one and number three. OK, so to start with. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the four factors we're going to look at today. And before I start, I want to cast your eyes over to that star on the right hand side. We are applying what we already know. OK, we have already looked at all of these. Certainly the hidden curriculum, teacher labeling, language, parental attitude. OK, we've looked at these before. So if you need to, I would pause this video, go back and revise really quickly those key terms. If you need to have another look at them to have a clear understanding in your head because i will talk about them a little bit but i'm also going to assume that you know a lot about them already okay so if you need to get it back in your head pause this go back over them and then come back to this okay um there are two external factors that we're going to look at remember external factors are factors that are external to school okay so they are things like the family or your material deprivation, your cultural situation, that kind of stuff. And then there are internal factors, factors which are internal to the school processes within the school building. OK, our external factors are immigration and cultural expectations and language and parental attitude. Our internal factors are the hidden curriculum and teacher labelling. And there are plenty more factors that you can have a look at as well. Things like material deprivation. Certain ethnic groups generally seem to be financially better or worse off than others. But we're not going to look at that too much today. We're going to look at just these four factors. So to start with, this is the factor of immigration. Studies have shown that children from immigrant families display a higher work ethic than those who are native born. Now, I've just seen on that screen there is a, a typo. Work ethnic is meant to be work ethic. Difficult to um, get that right when you're writing a slide on ethnicity. You get into the habit of writing that, but that's not that's not the right spelling. I do apologize. Children from immigrant families generally what this is saying is work harder in schools. Now, this could be for a number of reasons, and the study from the International Migration Review does go into a few of them. And the one that seemed to be the most influential reason was that if you are an immigrant in a country and an immigrant is somebody who has come into a country from another, a migrant is someone who leaves a country to go elsewhere. So an immigrant has come into the country from elsewhere. If you're an immigrant, you don't you don't migrate to another country for a worse life, you migrate for a better life. You know, you wouldn't leave a fantastic life and go somewhere else if you knew that life elsewhere would be worse. So migration and immigration is usually factored around two things. Number one, economic factors. So being able to have a, a better life elsewhere, i.e. a wealthier life elsewhere. And number two, necessity. This might be because of war or famine or persecution. So either reason, is for a positive improvement in your life. So somebody who's come to the United Kingdom from another country might feel particularly lucky to be in the United Kingdom and therefore might have a greater work ethic because they want to make it work. They want to make it right. They want they want to you know take hold of the chance that they've just been given to have a new start in life. And so if you were a, uh, a migrant in the United Kingdom, um, you might find yourself treating school as more of a 
luxury than some of the native born children there who have only ever known the UK and the UK system. So you might have attitudes such as, you know, I'm really lucky to be here. This is much better than where I used to live, which might then mean that you work harder in school. You must make the most of it because you've been given this opportunity, this situation. So it might be that children from, from immigrant families display a higher work ethic than native borns um, because they feel deeply lucky and fortunate to be in a situation. We can also see in school settings across the world that the UK school system is different to others in the world. There's not one school system across the whole world, like a one size fits all. You know, the way that we do school is very different to, for example, China. In China, children work very, very hard very hard they start school much earlier than we do they finish school later than we do and then they'll have more time at home for homework as well you can have children working at least 10 hours a day and i know you know lockdown right now feels like you're working the whole time but for children in chinese schools there is that real kind of emphasis on hard work really 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 hard working summer holidays can be spent preparing for exams or being in summer schools um, and if a parent so um, let's say a, a, a chinese family has moved to the united kingdom and the parent went through that school system in china and their their child is now going to school in england that parent might have that similar type of attitude towards their child's education. So they might be getting their child to, to do a lot more hours of homework than native born children because that's what they were used to when they were at school. OK, so um, that might be a difference in parental attitude between sort of immigrant families and native born children. Now, obviously, there is a glaring criticism of this approach and you might have already been screaming at your computer already. Not every child from a non-white ethnic group is an immigrant. I mean, it's, it's completely ignorant to think that just because someone's not white, they must be an immigrant. There are the vast majority of non-white people in the United Kingdom are native born. And so this view only really works when talking about children who are immigrants, not all ethnicities. OK, so it's a small factor, but it could go some way to explaining a very small group of people in the UK. Let's move on to our second external factor, and that is language. So we've talked a little bit about language before when talking about class and when talking about material deprivation. And the argument we made was that if you are somebody who hasn't got the money or the time growing up to be able to read lots of books, then your um, vocabulary will be stunted and your development, your cognitive development is somewhat delayed, somewhat stunted. On the flip side, if you're somebody who's able to read quite a lot, then you obviously have a lot more understanding of words. And we have seen many studies which have shown that children who read more perform better in school, get better grades. OK. We're going to apply that same idea now, but to ethnicity. So for some pupils in the school system, English is not their first language. OK, we would call these we group these children EAL, OK, English as an additional language. So their first language um, could be something completely different um, and they are learning English. They might have a firm grip of English. They might understand most of it, all of it, maybe or they might just be recently learning it. Either way, you're going to see a, uh, obviously a, a disadvantage compared to those who are fluent. So the argument is that if your understanding of English isn't fluent, if you don't really grasp English as much as you do another language, then it's going to be very difficult to access school because the lessons are done in English unless it's an MFL lesson. Um, the teacher speaks in English, um, often using tier two language like compare, contrast, evaluate, words that you wouldn't often learn if you were learning a language for the first time. Um, the textbook is written in English and obviously the exam paper is all in English. So you're going to find it really hard to fully understand what you're being asked to do. So a lot of children who are EAL are not stupid, but they just can't understand the English textbook or the English exam paper. And if it was maybe in their first language, it might be a lot easier for them. And you can see the evidence on this on this graph on the right hand side. The blue bar is non EAL pupils. So for children who for whom English is their first language. 
and the red bar is EAL pupils. And you can see over every year from 2008 to 2012, children who are EAL have scored lower in GCSEs than those who are not. Okay, so language does seem to be a factor in educational performance based on your ethnicity and your grasp of English. Now, the criticism of this is that children who are bilingual or multilingual and who are fluent in English, so children who really, really do have a great understanding of English, but also who fluently speak Spanish or Russian or Polish or whatever it might be, actually do better than those who only speak English. So if you had like a three tier system, you have in the middle children who only speak English. OK, at the bottom, you have children who are English as an additional language. So they, yes, they do worse than those who only speak English. But those above at the top are children who are bilingual or multilingual who are fluent in English. So it's actually better to be able to speak more languages fluently than it is just just speak one, because learning a language takes a lot of work and you're it changes how your brain operates and all these things that I don't quite understand, but it's why MFL is an important subject. OK, so I know when you complain about MFL, don't complain about it. It's an important subject. Um, children who are bilingual or multilingual do better than those who are only speaking English. So, yes, language is a factor, but it could actually be a positive factor as well as a negative one. OK, so that's our two external factors. We're going to move now to our internal ones. To start with, the hidden curriculum. This picture, we have looked at this picture before in year nine when looking at the idea of ethnocentrism. Now, ethnocentrism is when you view your culture, your own culture, as superior to others. On the flip side, when you look at another culture and go, oh, that's so strange, that's ethnocentric. Okay, a lot of people view for example, the Maasai practice of drinking cow's blood to be strange. But for a Maasai, it's entirely normal. In fact, it's part of their everyday life or their existence, not every day. Ethnocentrism is when you look at things through the lens of your own culture. OK, and a lot of people criticise the British education system for being ethnocentric. So that means that we look at items through the British lens. We study Britain and not much else. OK, so we're very Britain focused. These are some famous faces that you would have studied in history, science, English. And I'm fully aware that uh, the man on the moon is not British he is white okay so it could be that we look through a western white lens rather than just a british one so we've got william shakespeare we've got winston churchill we've got um armstrong on the moon and underneath my video face there's also thomas edison okay the the, the, the light bulb man um these are all western white people and there have been many criticisms made of the UK curriculum as being too ethnocentric. We don't deal enough with black history. We don't deal enough with Asian history. And when we do look at people of colour in other ethnic groups, it's often from a negative. OK, so that's there's there's that really powerful song um, or the rap that, that Dave made um, 2019 called Black, where he talks about how in schools, we, we, we put pictures up of black people on their knees as slaves or in famine. We don't necessarily celebrate black. Instead, in the British education system, we can be guilty of vilifying it, either looking in terms of crime or poverty or famine. OK, so it's it's quite a big criticism to be making of the UK education system, but it is one that people make and it is one that you can you can largely see some basis in. Our history and our curriculum is largely white focused and ethnocentric. And because of the formal curriculum being ethnocentric, maybe you've got the formal curriculum, which is what's on top of the iceberg, and the hidden curriculum is underneath the eye, bit of the water, stuff that you can't see. If the formal curriculum is focusing on the achievements of white people, then the hidden curriculum promotes the idea that white is right. 
Okay, if the formal curriculum, you spend your science lessons, English lessons, history lessons, etc, etc, looking at the achievements of white people, then underneath that iceberg, what you are getting the sense of is that achievements belong to white people. And if you are a student in that classroom who is not white, you might not recognize any of the people up on that screen as members of your ethnic group because they're all white. And so you might not have as many role models in the classroom, on the screen, in the lesson from your ethnic group as the white children do. OK, so you can see quite, quite starkly there the difference in um, kind of how the education system portrays British culture, white culture, Western culture versus others. And that might go some way to explaining potentially um, why children from other ethnic groups such as Black Caribbean do not feel so uh, valued within the school system. Okay, and some people would take that as a way of trying to understand the rates of exclusion in schools. If you don't feel valued by the school system, you are less likely to conform to it and therefore you're more likely to rebel. Okay, that could be an argument that, 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 that is made. Now, there is a criticism of this approach, the idea that, you know, white kids do better because the, the British system is white focused. And that's as we saw in the graph earlier, white British children do not perform as well as the national average or children from other ethnic groups such as Asian or Indian. OK, so if we are saying that the UK system is ethnocentric, which by and large it could be accused as, then surely white British children should do the best out of all the groups. And actually, that's not the case. OK, so whilst this might be true that our system is ethnocentric, it might also not be a factor in educational achievement. Certainly for white British children, they don't seem to be benefiting much from it. We've got our final internal factor that is teacher labeling. Now we've seen this study before. This was done by Yale University. Um, and what they, what they did is they basically looked at how teachers label children based on gender and ethnicity. And we looked at this to start with, with gender, and we looked at it with class as well. But now let's hone in on the ethnic differences here. Teachers in the study conducted by Yale were looking, most were watching, watching in the sense of keeping an eye on black boys more than any other group. White boys were second, so boys collectively were the largest group but black boys were the number one targeted group from teachers. And we can see, and it's a quite a difficult to see graph, but this has been up on previous lessons. I do apologize that you can't see it brilliantly here. Black children in the same study were found to be hugely overrepresented in children who were permanently expelled from school. So the number of children, the percentage of children enrolled in a school for black children was 17 percent. But the, the percentage of those who have been suspended multiple times was 44 percent. So they are hugely overrepresented in terms of expulsion um, from school and suspension from school. What we can conclude from this is that teachers do seem to negatively label some ethnic groups such as black boys. Conversely, other studies have found that teachers can also be guilty of labelling other ethnic groups such as Asian girls as hardworking or well behaved. And if we were to take this and apply it to that graph at the start of the video, where we saw that on the very top of the tree were Indian and Chinese pupils and at the bottom were black Caribbean pupils. We didn't see the gender, but we saw the ethnicity that might have some correlation in how teachers view those particular children. Black children are troublemakers compared to Asian children are hardworking or well behaved is the is the kind of assumption that has been made. Now, if we were to criticize this, because it's a very, very strong point. If we were to criticise this, we could argue that this is more of a gender issue. As we can see from the from the study from Yale, boys were targeted in general a lot more than girls. So this could be a gender issue more than a, a race one or an ethnicity one. 
or it could be a class issue. We looked at the idea of the ideal pupil being a middle class child rather than a working class child. OK, but it is still goes without saying that teacher labelling can be a huge factor in the educational achievement of children. And if a teacher is labelling a certain ethnic group in a certain way, that could massively impact on how they treat that ethnic group and how they treat that child and then the self-fulfilling prophecy that emerges from that and how the child behaves and how the child views themselves. Okay, so this could be quite a key factor. So we've got our four factors. If you need to, I'd like you to pause and rewind and go back over the factors and make notes over on each of them. OK, make sure you include the criticisms of each view as well as the view itself. OK, let's have two sides to every argument as much as possible. I want you to include statistics, facts to back up the point. OK, it's, it's, it's much better to be able to prove a point rather than just to state it. OK, so people believe this. This is a factor. Here is the evidence for that view. OK, try and get that as much as possible um, in your notes. And then once you've done that, I would like you to evaluate the different factors you have got. You should have four different factors written down and four different criticisms. So you've got two points on every single view. I would now like you to decide which you think is the most influential factor in explaining why some ethnic groups in the UK perform better than others. Now, you could, if you wanted to, choose a combination of two. OK, so you might want to say it's this and it's this and here's why. Whichever factor or factors you choose, you must explain your reasoning. Why do you think this is the most influential factor or the most influential factors? OK, I have summarised them here for you. I'm going to give you a chance just to read them. OK, so there are the four factors. Which do you think is the most influential or are you going to combine two of them? Why? Why do you think they are the most influential factors in explaining the differences in ethnic achievement in schools? And once you've done that, let's just check over our objectives. We were setting out to be able to explain the statistics. Have you done that? To be able to describe the key factors. Have you got that? And can you evaluate which you think is the most influential factor? If you can't do one of these, I'd recommend you go back over the video and go over the bit that you need the most. And if you need any help, please let me know. Thanks very much.